Amen. Amen. All right, we'll go ahead and take out your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. We are doing a verse-by-verse study through the book of 2 Timothy, and uh, we took quite a bit of a break over the holidays to do some topical things dealing with Christmas and those kind of things, but we're, we're getting back into 2 Timothy, hot and heavy, and uh, this is our second time back into the book uh, since the holidays, and so looking at those verses again, chapter 2, verse 14 says, "...remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord." not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like a cancer. I am... Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Again, Father, we ask that you'd apply this in our lives. Lord, help us to understand it and bring the power of your Holy Spirit to bear on upon our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, jumping into this here today, I've entitled the message, Wielding the Sword. It's interesting, last week, if you are here with us, you remember we talked about unchaining the Word of God. Paul says here, I'm in prison, I'm in chains, but the Word of God is not chained, right? The Word of, not, the word of God cannot be chained. No matter how much man, no matter how much Satan tries to chain the word of God down and restrict it and keep it from going out, it just goes. As long as we are faithful to be a part of that. And now he takes that a little bit step further here today. And he begins to talk about applying the word of God, not as a a sword necessarily to hurt but as a surgical scalpel to do the work that needs to be done in the heart of men and women everywhere, a healing, cutting tool that uh, does the work that God needs to do in our hearts. As we allow God's word to be unchained and to be used in our lives, as we come to God and say, God, just use the word of God to to just change me, to cut away the the cancerous areas of my body that are bringing problems into my life and and restraining me from doing the work that I need to do for you. Lord, do that cutting work that needs to be done. And that's the idea of wielding this sword. Uh, We've talked so much in the last couple of chapters or the last couple of uh, sermons on this series Paul dealing with this idea of Timothy being afraid of being a pastor, being afraid of preaching the word of God, because again, as we talk so many times, there's a massive persecution against Christianity going on. And so Timothy's kind of drawing back. He's seeing pastors getting thrown into prison. He's seeing pastors being persecuted and their families being persecuted. He sees his own mentor, Paul, in prison as he's writing this letter and the letter that he wrote him before. And so there's this tendency to draw back and to not want to preach the word of God, to not want to unchain the word of God, to not want to wield that sword that needs to be wielded. And and Paul's encouraging Timothy, no, you need to keep on doing that work. Keep on doing that work of a surgeon and applying the word of God to people's lives. Don't restrain yourself from that and go back to teaching old wise fables and nonsense as you see what he says in the passage here today be a good worker be a worker that is not that doesn't need to be ashamed of the work that you are doing and so that's kind of what we're going to look at here today now as I was thinking about this and being a worker I was thinking back to one of my first jobs that I ever had and uh, my uncle owned my uncle John that you guys have met he preached here uh, a few times um, at the time I was in the sixth grade I think ending the sixth grade going into the seventh grade sometime in that that time frame at the late 70s there my uncle John owned this restaurant slash gas station slash hotel uh, slash firecracker stand um, right on the border of Wyoming and Montana as you drove over that border into Montana 
heading north, you would see off to the side of the road this little complex that my uncle owned and was trying to run at the time. And uh, he invited my brother and I to come up and work for him for the summer. And so we did. Young kids, much younger than the two boys than, that you see here. And part of our job was to pump gas. It was a full service gas station and we'd go out there and pump gas for people and, uh, and sell the fireworks. And so as a part of this job of selling fireworks, you know, as the new fireworks would come in, we would stock the shelves and, and sell the fireworks. Now, you have to question my uncle's wisdom in allowing a seventh grader and a sixth grader to sell fireworks and bump gas, but that's beyond the point. <laughs> And so oftentimes, you know, we'd be in the firecracker stand and we'd be bored. And so we'd start goofing around as young kids often do. And uh, one of the shipments that came of fireworks, we found this one box. And as we we're unloading the boxes, we just opened this box and it had nothing but wicks in it. These long wicks, just about that long. And we thought, well, what are these for? You know, why would you use these? All the fireworks already have their own wicks. Why would you have just a wick? And uh, we found as we lit those wicks on fire, they would just rapidly, zip, you know, and, and it was quite entertaining. And so we were lighting these things on fire, not thinking we're in a firecracker stand. And that's probably not the wisest thing. And, uh, and so at one point, I think it was probably me, uh, I had a stack of those wicks laying here on the counter. And uh, I was just lighting the wick in my hand, and then when it get close to my fingers, I'd throw it out. Well, it got a little too close, and, and I threw it, but it didn't get outside of the firecracker stand. It landed on the countertop where those other wicks were. Not a good situation. And I thought for sure we were going to blow up the, the, the stand there. And it didn't, but it made a nice little burn mark right on that countertop. And uh, so what did we do? Well, we took a sign and put it over the top of that, you know, just to cover that up a little bit, as young boys would do. You know, that'll fool them. Nobody will ever see that. Nobody will ever notice that. And my uncle comes out a little while later, and he sees this little new, newly uh, applied sign on the top of the counter. He's like, hmm, what's this? <laughs> and he rips it off and sees the burn mark on the counter. Well, I tell that story to say... I was not a good worker at the time, I will tell you that. I was a terrible worker. I was a foolish young kid who had no business pumping gas and selling fireworks in a, in a firecracker stand. And that was made very obvious to my uncle at that time. And I think he said, you know, why don't you go work in the restaurant with your Aunt Donna? And that's probably what I did. But, um, you know, the, the wisdom of that, though, thinking back on that and thinking about what a, what a terrible job I did in that firecracker stand. And, and thinking about how bad that could have turned out. Blowing up the firecracker stand right next to the gas station, uh, you know, I could have just killed a bunch of people. I could have just uh, destroyed that whole place with my foolishness. And I think about that in the light of, of, of how we do work in this life and our diligence to do good work. And that's really what Paul is talking about here as he applies this concept to Timothy. As he says to him, you know, you need to be a worker that's not ashamed of the work that you have done as a pastor, as a Bible teacher. And I've, I've put that one verse back up here because I think it's so, so powerful. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that idea of rightly dividing is rightly wielding, correctly using the word of God so that it does the work that God intends it to do. Be a good worker. He's talked about being a good soldier. He's talked about being a good athlete. He's talked about being a hardworking farmer and the rewards that come from that. And now he applies that as a, as a minister of the gospel, as a Bible teacher, as a, uh, a believer in Jesus Christ. Be diligent to be a good worker. Am I cutting out? Okay, I'm kind of hearing the cutting out, but... Be a good worker. Don't need to be ashamed of what you've done. And of course, that brings into our minds a concept of the fact that, you know, imagine standing before God, standing before God and, and showing the work that you've done upon this earth, showing the, the good deeds that you have done. Imagine standing before him and him coming and investigating and, and seeing what you've done. But you know, that's not a nebulous concept. Because we will. 
every one of us will stand before God someday and we will give an account for how we've lived our lives. We will stand there and we will show forth the, the things that we have done in our life. We will stand there and, and God will inspect that fruit that we have brought forth. It's not just a, a Bible verse. You know, it's not just a nebulous concept. We will do that, each one of us. The Bible says that the believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Christ will judge the works that we have done that are placed upon the foundation of what Jesus has done. Jesus died on the cross and established this good work, and we are standing on that foundation. But what have we done since we've been standing there? What good things have we done? What good fruit have we brought forth? Because Jesus will inspect those good works. He will investigate. He will look at the works that we have done, and he will say either good, good work or it's all wheat and chaff and it's going to be burned up. It's no good. There's nothing redeeming about that. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not saved. If we were not saved, we would stand before the judgment seat of God, the white throne judgment he talks about in the book of Revelation. And of course, that's even, uh, that's a, just a horrible thought to think of standing before God, trying to justify why I should get into heaven, not even standing on the foundation of Christ. Hey, you know, I donated to the Save the Whales Foundation and, you know, I helped this old lady across the street and don't you remember when I did this? And, and of course, we know that God will say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. But as we think about this here today, I want you to put yourself in this category. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a Bible teacher, whether you're, uh, you know, somebody that works in the, the cafe or cleans the toilets, it doesn't matter. You are a servant of Jesus Christ. You are a worker of Jesus Christ. And someday you will stand before the Lord and he says to each one of us, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Not that we get to heaven because we're approved by the good works. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the works that we do based on that foundation of Jesus Christ. He says, go and bear good fruit. And we will stand before the Lord and he says, work hard at it. Be diligent to bring forth good fruit. Be a worker that doesn't need to be ashamed of the work that you've done but rightly divide or rightly wield that work. Use the tools that God has given you, the gifts that God has given you to do good work for him because indeed we will stand before him someday. And so the Bible has often, in the Bible itself, been compared to a double-edged sword. The, the sword of God's word. Are you skilled with it? Are you able to use it in your own life to, to rightly look at your life and understand what your life is about and, and how you're walking with the Lord and how diligent you are serving him? Are you able to look at God's word and say, well, yes, I'm doing that, but I'm not doing that very well. And, and I need to work on these areas and I need to work on these areas. Well, of course, if we never open that book. We're, we're never going to know that. And so there's first the need to inspect God's word, to study it ourselves, study to show yourself approved before God. And then also to be able to now take that sword and, and go into the life of someone else and gently show them what God expects from them, to be able to help others, to be that skillful surgeon to help others see uh, how God sees them and see the forgiveness that God has for them, the mercy, the grace that he wants to pour out in them. And of course, that's another understanding of wielding the sword of God's word. And so it's interesting, this word, or these two words that we see, rightly divided. This is actually one word in the Greek, a composite of two words that have been brought together here. And you see the word there. I'm not going to try to uh, uh, say what that word is. But you see at the very beginning, orthot. Orthotics, think of orthotics, orthopedics. I mean, this is a medical term. You can see that right away. Uh, but it has other applications as well as we see this word. It's the idea of making a straight cut. That is to dissect correctly, proceed on straight paths, hold a straight course, 
And, and so think again about an orthodontist. What does an orthodontist do? He makes your teeth straight. <laughs> You've got crooked, nasty teeth. He goes in there and he straightens those, those teeth. Uh, a surgeon goes in and he makes the cuts in the proper areas to make sure that that body heals. Uh, orthotics, the idea of your shoes, you know, if you're walking with your heels inside, you know, they, they put something in there to make you walk straight, and those, those ideas. This is coming all the way back from the ancient Greek language, orthopedics, and, and you can go on and on with those terms. And of course, we can uh, extend this into a, a metaphor of walking straight before the Lord, walking righteously before the Lord, doing right to make straight and smooth, handle rightly, to teach the truth directly and correctly. And that's where, again, we get the word orthodox from. An orthodox way of teaching the Bible is the right way to teach the Bible. The accepted way, the, the proper interpretation and application of God's word is an orthodox way. You know, I was... Um, last year, I, I finished my, my bachelor's degree in ministry, and I was thinking about, you know, should I continue on? Should I continue on and get a master's degree, you know, and, and maybe even a doctorate down the road some point? I don't know. But I was kind of weighing that, and I thought, well, not for now. But, uh, you know, I just recently started working on a master's degree. Just one course at a time, you know, it's going to take me forever, but that's all right. But it's not in ministry. And I made a determination that I'm not going to go for a degree in ministry higher than what I have now because the higher you go into education and the ministry, the more unorthodox it becomes. The more we start studying guys like Karl Barth, you know, the, the founder of the neo-orthodox -orth movement and all these German scholars who don't even believe that Jesus came and died on the cross. Very unorthodox doctrines. You have to start learning those, and you have to start uh, being indoctrinated into those kind of things. The further you get into your education in the ministry, it just seems like that's what you have to deal with. I had to deal with it enough as just at the undergraduate level, and I said, no, no more. I don't need any more of that stuff. I don't need any more of that. And so the idea of orthodoxy, the correct, the true way of understanding God's word, and that's the idea that Paul is, is telling Timothy here. You need to correctly wield that sword so that the people in your congregation are able to receive that word from the Lord. And all of these unorthodox ways in their lives can be corrected. These ways that are hurting them can be healed. And, and that's the idea that Paul is bringing here, this this way of cutting into. And you see, someone has once said, God's word cuts and heals at the same time. Like a surgeon's scalpel, it cuts through the cancer of the flesh. And Paul will even use that term here in, in the passage that we're looking at here today. The, the cancer, it's eating away. False teaching, false doctrine in the church, it eats away like a cancer. And it's the job of the pastor, the Bible teachers, the, the ministers of the word of God to correctly remove those cancers. Because what happens when you get cancer and you don't deal with it? Right. Yeah, you die, right? It spreads and spreads and spreads until it kills you. And that's the idea behind false doctrine. That's why Satan uses it so much within the body of Christ. He knows that often it's unseen, undetected, and before you know it, it spreads so much within the body that there's a, there's a cancer now. The actual word there in the Greek is, is the, where we get the word gangrene from. A gangrene sore that is just spreading at a rapid rate. That gangrene, once they detect it, boy, they got to get on top of it or you'll die quickly from a gangrene sore if you don't get that under control. And so that's the idea behind this. Take that scalpel, wield it, and use it. Apply it in the lives of the believers. Application, it's an it's a interesting thing. Sir Francis Bacon once said, It is not what men eat, but what they digest that makes them strong. Not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. Not what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned. Not what we preach, but what we practice that makes us Christians. The application of God's word. We can hear it being preached, but if we're not willing to apply it in our lives and actually practice it, 
Boy, that's a, that's a heavy, heavy statement right there. And so one verse I think that completely encapsulates this whole idea is Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from its sight, his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who, whom we must give an account. Isn't that a powerful verse? The word of God, it's alive. So unchain it. Unchain the word of God. Let it go out and do its work. Put the word of God, the sword of God, into the hands of people who can wield that sword and who can go out and do the work once you're able to apply it, once you're able to bring it forth and, and allow it to do its work, it will cut. It goes down into the division of the soul and the spirit. I mean, you can't get much further into the, 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 the psyche of the human being than that. Cutting between the soul and the spirit, and we don't even understand fully what that means, but that's what God's word says it does. It makes that powerful, precision kind of a cut to the joints and the marrow of your body. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. The word of God. Allow it to do the work in your life. If you've been gifted to wield that sword, go wield the sword. Go out and, and do the cutting that needs to be done. It's interesting how this also affects the hearer of the word of God. Hey, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God's Holy Spirit sees into your life. He sees every aspect of your life. He knows where that cancerous wound is. He knows where that gangrene is. All things are naked and open to his eyes. And if you just come to him and say, God, do the work. You're the master surgeon. Just do the work in my life that needs to be done. Cut away this gangrene, cancerous disease that I have in my life called sin. Take it out so that I can be healed, so that I can serve you and bring forth good fruit for your service. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? Well, as we go back and look at the verses one last time here, um, we'll just quickly go through there. A couple of things. First is uh, approved by God. We all want to be approved by God, don't we? We all want to stand there and hear those words. Well done. Approved. Stamp of approval right on your forehead. Approved. Come on in. Enter into your rest. You've done a great job. You're approved by God. And then the idea, if we're going to be approved by God, we have to be on that solid foundation. And we'll look at that quickly. Interesting what... Uh, an older woman said to her pastor one day after his sermon, she came up to him and said, that was a wonderful sermon, pastor, just wonderful. Everything you said applies to someone I know. <laughs> it all applies to those people. And certainly people look at the word of God like that. You know, I'm perfect, but boy, I know somebody that that would apply to. And you're all nudging each other right now, right? Oh, right, yeah, that's you, huh? But um, allowing it to cut into my heart, allowing it to cut down into the joints and marrow of my life, between the, the soul and the spirit of my own heart and life, allowing God to just do his work. I think every time we come to a Bible teaching, every time we come to a sermon, every time we come to any time the Bible is being taught, we need to have that mindset right there. Hey, this isn't just for other people. This is for me. And certainly every time I begin to preach a, a sermon, I, I try to look at it in that same way. This is not just stuff I want to inflict on the congregation. Lord, inflict me, you know. Do the cutting work that needs to be done in my life. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's painful. I don't like it sometimes. I, I read some things this week that uh, pierced my heart about this subject right here. And I'm not even going to show them to you because they're just embarrassing to me. 
there's a couple verses I was going to, or some statements I was going to put on here, but they're just kind of, no, that's too close to home. Boy, God knows. We were talking about it last week. You know, God knows where to put that finger. You know, we think we're doing such a good job of hiding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> put a little fig leaf over the top of that sin. You know, God will never see that. And God, he goes, let me see there. Oh, yeah, there it is. Boy, how foolish it is for us to try to hide from God when he could heal us if we just come to him and say, yeah, you know what's wrong. You're the master surgeon. Just fix me, Lord. Come to him, not trying to hide those things, but just allowing him to do that work that needs to be done in our life. It's not for everybody else. It's for me. And so looking at those verses again, Paul says, remind them of these things. Boy, that's so powerful to me. The word remember, remind in the Bible, it's, it's said so many times. Why? Because we always forget, don't we? It's amazing to me how many times God has just opened my eyes to a truth in his word about my own life or about, you know, just a spiritual situation. And, uh, you know, it's just profound. And then I go about my way and just completely forget about it until 5, 10, 15 years later. And it's like, oh, yeah, wow. We need to be reminded we need to be reminded over again. And so Paul, remind them of these things. Charge them before the Lord. Not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. And again, we've talked about it so much. You know, Paul, looking back, um, back into 1 Timothy even and, and 2 Timothy, this idea of false doctrine not just in the sense of, okay, the Bible says this, and, and this is misinterpreting the, what the Bible said, but it's just teaching nonsense. It's just teaching things that don't help people, but disguising it in spiritual language so people think they're getting a sermon, they think they're getting a, a solid Bible teaching, but it's, it's really just nonsense that doesn't apply to any area of our lives, and we just walk out of there feeling good about ourselves maybe, uh, but no real work has been done. It's just idle words. It's idle talk. The word of God hasn't been brought to, to the forefront. You know, it hasn't been wielded. It hasn't been used as a scalpel. It's just, again, as we talked about last week, you know, a little bit of salt of the, the word, a little bit of pepper, you know, just to season it, just to make it sound spiritual. But really, this is just a humanistic, uh, feel good, uh, here's your, your best life now kind of a message, you know. No, the, the word of God, man, let it loose, unleash it, unchain it, put it into the hands of people who will use it in the way that it was meant to be used so that our hearts can be healed, our lives can be healed, our minds can be healed. But when we're talking about words that have no profit, we're just ruining the people that are listening to the word. And that's what was happening in the church of Ephesus that Timothy was pastoring. These wolves had been allowed to come in and just teach a bunch of nonsense. Um, as Paul tells Timothy back in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. He goes back to chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and, wives, and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. This time of human history, you know, the, the Greek uh, philosophies and the, the mystery religions of Babylon and all these things were very, very popular at this time. And so a lot of those things would work their way into the Christian message the Gnosticism of the time and Epicurus and all these, these uh, Greek scholars that were revered, their message was working its way in. But it was a bunch of nonsense, you know. It's not the word of God. It's not the true word of God. And, and so just keep that nonsense out of there, the old wise fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. These good words, these, these faithful words, these words of good doctrine, use these don't talk about philosophy. It will take you nowhere. Be diligent, he says, to present yourself approved 
to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we've already uh, talked about that verse quite a bit, but I just love that word diligent. And I know we've talked about this before, but as we were raising our daughters and, and Geraldine was homeschooling them, you know, that was the word. That was the, the word right there. Be diligent. Come on, be diligent. Be a diligent uh, studier, you know, and, and that was just constantly taught to our kids from Geraldine, and I just love that, you know, be diligent in your studies, be diligent to do good work. And I think as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, again, no matter if you're a pastor or whatever you're, you're doing as you serve the Lord, be diligent about it. Diligently wash that toilet over there. I, I, <laughs> I'm going to harp on Gary here. I love Gary. I, I love Gary because he cleans those toilets so well. I come in here like on a Thursday or something, I have to drop by and pick something up or drop something off or I just got some time to kill and I hang out over at the church and study or whatever. And I go in that bathroom and now that blue water is in there and that toilet is just so dang clean and I just like, man, awesome. I just love it. It smells good in there. He's done a diligent job and it brings glory to the Lord. I just think it's amazing. I don't know why, but I really do. I love it. Yes. So be diligent, whatever, whatever calling that the Lord has in your life, whatever the Lord has placed in your heart to do for your service to him, do it with gusto. Do all things as unto the Lord, the Bible says. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Imagine standing there before the Lord. Lord, I cleaned this toilet. I pray that it's approved before you. <laughs> Look at the blue water, Lord. Is this toilet approved? You know, um, you know, whatever it is, you think about that in your own life. But if, again, on the more spiritual side of it as well, uh, the minister of the word has to rightly divide that word, rightly use that word and wield that sword so that people's hearts can be affected by it. And that is uh, a wrong slide. That's from last week. Everybody remember that slide from last week? We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. The solid foundation, moving on to the, the last couple of verses of the, the passage here. And so now the other side of that is, be a good servant of the Lord, wield that sword, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. That's the real problem, right? People don't want to hear the real word of God being taught. They don't want to have the wielding of the sword of God being brought into their lives. They don't want that, that sharp, double-edged sword scalpel coming into their life because they want to live ungodly. And the Bible doesn't allow you to do it, right? And so ultimately, you know, you can talk about seeker friendliness. You can talk about all these other concepts that people use and their excuses for not teaching the word of God verse by verse and, and expounding upon the word of God and applying it the way we're doing it here today, I hope. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to ungodliness. People don't want to hear the word of God because it holds me to account. They don't want to see the sword of the word of God being used because it holds me to account. It points the finger at me. It identifies a cancer in my life. It identifies a wound that needs to be healed. And if I want to live in that ungodliness, I don't want to know about that. I don't want to know that I'm doing wrong here. Nobody wants to be told they're doing wrong, right? No wrong, just right. I mean, you see all those kind of advertising campaigns out there. You know, people don't want to be told they're, they're in the wrong. They're unrighteous. They want to go through life feeling that everything they do is right. And, and don't want to be told they're doing something wrong. But the Bible doesn't allow you to do that. If you read the word of God, it points the finger. It says you've got a cancer in your life and you need to deal with that or it will destroy you. It will kill you. The message, it spreads like cancer, like gangrene. How long would you allow a gangrene sore to grow on your leg? You know, you wake up one morning, what's that smell? Oh my gosh, I got gangrene on my leg there. Oh, I better get, get that taken care of next week, probably. <laughs> Honey, go ahead and set up an appointment for the doctor's office, probably uh, next month. Yeah, go ahead, next month, that's the soonest one. Yeah, we'll do that next month. No, you're, you're headed for the emergency room right now, right? You're not gonna put that off. You got cancer. 
you know, the doctor's not going to say, well, you got cancer, but don't worry about it. You know, we'll come back in six months. We'll check it out then. No, they're going to start a treatment right away if it's an aggressive type of a cancer. And that's the idea that the seriousness of our own sin, the seriousness of false doctrine coming into the church, we don't just tolerate it. We don't just put up with it and think, well, you know, they're just a little confused. No, they're, in de they're deceived into believing a false doctrine, and it's a false doctrine that will bring forth cancer if we don't identify it. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do it in love. Obviously, the Bible says the truth in love, right? We speak the truth, but we speak it in love, and we don't try to bash people over the head because sometimes people are just deceived by the world, and they just need to understand it more clearly. And, and so, again, that's the job of the, the Bible teacher. And so he identifies two guys, and, uh, you know, that's why a lot of times I'm not afraid to identify false teaching ministries and, and name names, because Paul did it. The Bible does it. You know, hey, beware of those guys over there. They're, te they're preaching false doctrine. Don't go over there. They're, they're preaching false doctrine. It's unloving to, to just, well, you know, uh, don't worry about it. You know, it's unloving for you to know the truth and not warn people if they're heading into error is the idea. And so Paul names names. He says, hey, these guys are of that sort. They've strayed concerning the truth of the word of God. And so watch out for them. They're preaching that the resurrection's already passed. What is that going to do? It's going to destroy the faith of some. And, you know, there are doctrines out there today that, um, that talk about the, that the resurrection has already passed. They look and they say, well, 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, that's when the Lord actually kind of came down in some kind of spiritualized uh, rapture. And that's when the resurrection happened. And really, you know, with this Gnostic belief system that they had back then, they believed the, bo the body was completely evil. And so there was no reason to resurrect the body. It's just a spiritual resurrection, those kind of things. It's probably what they're talking about here but we don't know for sure. But obviously, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible, hasn't, the, the Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't teach that the resurrection has already happened. The Bible teaches that the resurrection is a, a future thing, that the Lord is going to return and take his own back with him to heaven, that he's going to come in physical form down to this earth and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And, uh, you know, people try to get around that with all kinds of uh, words to no, uh, you know, no effect, vain words, but it's really just idle babblings because it goes against what the Word of God says. We have to be very careful of those kind of things. And so the la last part here where he talks about the, the, the solid foundation, this seal of God, that he knows those who are his and let everyone who... Uh, names the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. This is actually from the Old Testament, the book of Numbers in the story of Korah. And I was very surprised about that. I didn't realize that it was pointing back to that story. And uh, I just wanted to bring you that story just real quick here in Numbers 16. Um, you remember that Moses has this congregation of probably a couple of million people out in the wilderness, and uh, they've instituted the Levitical priesthood and, you know, if you've sinned, you've got to bring this offering. And if you've done this, you, if you want to get closer to God, more dedicated to God, bring this offering, bring that offering. And, and the priesthood is run by the Levites. And they're doing all the work inside the, the, the temple there or the, the tabernacle of meeting. And no one else was allowed to do that. Well, this group comes along, these ungodly, wicked men come along, and they're uh, about 250 leaders from a larger group of people within the congregation who don't like Moses and they don't like the Levitical priesthood. They don't like how God has set this whole thing up and they want to challenge that. And so they come before him and they say, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Hey, who do you guys think you are anyway? You know, we're all just as good as you are and you know, and why can't we do the priesthood? And, and so they want to overturn what God has established in his word about how he wants this thing to run. And so they challenge Moses in this way. And Moses gets very upset about this. And then he says to them, he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is 
uh, will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. And so essentially what Moses is saying, okay, well, tomorrow morning, the Lord's going to come down here and he knows who's on his side. He knows those that are his because he's chosen them. He's elected them and he will choose those. But if you're not in that group that gets chosen, whoa, watch out. And, and, the, and so this judgment comes upon these people for their rebellion against the Lord, against his word. And, and so it's the same idea that Paul is saying here. The solid foundation of God stands knowing this, that God knows those that are his. He has chosen them. There's no doubt about it. And if you're on the Lord's side, you're safe. And, and so that's the idea that these two verses at the end here. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And so I think that's a great view of this whole argument about God's sovereignty and man's free will. You know, you see them both here, right here. Hey, God knows who he's chosen. But if you name the name of Christ, then depart from iniquity and choose God. You know, it's this idea of, of, of the, uh, the dual nature of this salvation that we have. God is sovereign. He has chosen. He knows those who have been elected. But if we name the name of Christ, if I have chosen by my own free will to name the name of Jesus Christ, then I depart from that iniquity and I consecrate myself to the Lord and I stay with him and I don't go run with the rest of the world into iniquity. Depart from, the, depart from iniquity if you know and name the name of Jesus Christ. That's the solid foundation that I hope that we're all standing here on today. But again, if you're standing on that foundation, if you say, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, then first of all, obviously depart from iniquity. But taking that to a further step, are you approved before God? Are your works approved before God? Are you diligently seeking him to serve him in a way that brings honor and glory to his name? Are you diligently wielding that sword that he has placed in your hands, that sword of service to serve him and to take care of the needs uh, of the people within the congregation? However God has called you to serve, are you doing that in a way that is pleasing to him? Are you a diligent worker, a diligent servant of the Lord? Because obviously when we are not diligent, we are not approved before God, we can cause a lot of damage. We can blow up firecracker stands. We can blow up gas stations. We can hurt a lot of people if we are foolish in our service to the Lord. If we are not diligently applying the word of God in our own lives and then trying to diligently apply the word of God into the lives of others around us, we can do a lot of damage. We can see a lot of people get hurt. And so Paul, again, reminds us of this. Wield that sword. Be a, a diligent worker, a worker who does not need to be ashamed that day that we stand before him and give an account for our actions, because we will. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for this very, very sharp instrument that you have placed in our hands. Lord, as we allow the word of God to be unchained, as we allow it to be wielded, as we just stand back and allow you to make the cuts that need to be made, to trim away the, the hardness of our hearts, to trim away those cancerous tumors, those gangrene sores that we have, Father, the sin in our lives, we ask, Lord, that you would just do your work, do your work, Father. Heal us. Lord, give us the ability to serve you in a way that is glorifying to you. Lord, as we look into next week's message, that we become that vessel of honor. After you've done your work, we're now a vessel of honor that can be used for every good work. And so, Father, we ask that in the coming week, that we would have a heart to be undergoing some surgery by you. 
Lord, we, we get worried when people tell us they have to go into surgery. But Father, as we view the surgery that you'd want to do in our own lives, we, we know it's a good thing. It might be painful. It might be uncomfortable for us. But Father, we know it's so necessary. And so Father, do your work this week so that we may, may all become that vessel of honor to be used by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.